Hello and welcome to The Daily Space for today, December 14th, 2018. My name is Dr. Pamela Gay and I am your host for today and I am here to put science in your brains. We have a number of top stories today, so I'm just going to dive straight on in with a story of a cometary visitor. This is an image that kind of looks like a whole lot of speckled black. That's because, well, our sky isn't always the clearest to see things in, and this is a pretty accurate representation of what it's like to go out and try and find the newest comet in town. This is Comet Wirtunen, or 46P. It's a comet that comes around the sun every 5.4 years. But last time it came around, it was closest to the sun when we were on the other side of the sun from the comet, so we didn't really get a good view. This year, the odds are completely different. It worked out that we ended up with the comet and us near one another and the comet about as close to the sun as it gets all at the same time, allowing us to see a faint green smudge in the sky. So this is the Pleiades right here. It's a group of stars, sometimes called the Seven Sisters, Subaru in Japanese. Um, it looks kind of like a little tiny ladle it is, uh, if you look east, you'll see Orion. Continue looking up early in the evening sky, you'll find the Pleiades. And this right here is Comet 46P Wirtunen. Now, people are having a lot of fun with this particular Christmas timed star. And what is one of my favorite acts of walking around until things line up perfectly. This photograph taken and, and I'm going to mispronounce this, I apologize, Blikvalsi, Norway, by Tommy Alesson. Uh, it shows the comet lined up perfectly with the top of an evergreen tree, making this a Christmas comet. This object is bright enough for you to see without your eye. It won't look, sorry, bright enough you, for you to see without binoculars. You do need your eyeballs. It's bright enough for you to see with the unaided eye, but it won't look this good. Um, if you have them, take out a pair of binoculars, grab a telescope, get a good look. This is the best comet we've had for a while and that we might have for a while. To help you find it, there's, well, there's star charts aplenty all across the internet. Just Google Comet 46P finding chart and one will pop up. Here you can see the uh, star Aldebaran, the bright burnt orange eye of the bull Taurus. Uh, you can also see here's Orion down here, and here's the Pleiades. Right now, the comet is making its way between Aldebaran and the Pleiades as it slowly moves down towards the horizon. So go out, look up, and catch yourself a comet, and while you're out there, you just might catch the tail end of the Geminids meteor shower. So do that tonight, because the comet, it's on a mad dash away right now, and it's going to be another 5.4 years before it comes into the inner solar system again, and we're not going to have this kind of an alignment for more than 20 more years. In other news, we have finally found out where in the most boring place on Mars, the InSight lander has landed. Because Elysium Planum, where the InSight lander landed, is so remarkably boring, we haven't been able to just look out at the horizon and use basic trigonometry to figure out where the lander is located. Instead, we needed to use the Mars High Rise instrument, which is on Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter, to look down and find the spacecraft and the other debris it's scattered across the surface of the red planet. Here we see an image that contains one of the spacecraft's shields as well as the parachute. Here we have the bottom of the heat shield which landed a bit further away and in the center of this dark smudge that's InSight Lander herself. All of this is scattered out about a thousand feet apart across the red surface in a nice little cluster. And uh, 
now we have good information on where the spacecraft is load is landed and it's also just kind of cool to be able to see things like a parachute from outer space now continuing our journey through the solar system and beyond we have a story of a star that decided to form like a planet in this particular solar system that was observed by the Alma Millimeter Array, um, the Atacama Large Millimeter Array, which is abbreviated Alma, we have two different stars surrounded by gas and dust. And what we see here is the gas coming towards us in the blue, the gas moving away from us in the red, and two bright spots which correspond to two pairs of star or two stars in a pair that form a binary system. This is a really unusual system. The massive star in the system, MM1b, it formed like any old star. It collapsed down, there's a, a stellar nebula around it, and uh, it's about 80 solar masses. So take the mass of the sun, multi multiply it by 80, and you get a giant star. That other star, MM1b on the outskirts of this disk, well, that's a companion star that's only half a solar mass, and it appeared to have formed the way planets normally form, by collapsing out of the fragmenting debris disk of dust and gas, and this shows us that while well, Jupiter truly is a failed star, you can get planets and stars when the mass ratio is great enough, forming in the same way. This is a rare case where the ratio between these two stars is a factor of 80, 1 to 80 between the two stars. We haven't seen this before, and uh, we don't know how common this kind of a situation is. The intriguing thing is that massive star is going to live and die in just a handful of millions of years. Whereas that half solar mass star, it's gonna live for trillions of years as a red dwarf, which means it's going to be there to watch that one star finish forming, go through its entire life cycle, explode as a supernova, and it's just gonna sit there doing its own little red dwarf thing, orbiting perhaps with some planets. And uh, it's going to be fun trying to figure out what the dynamics of that system will be after the supernova explodes. We won't be around for that, but it's still cool to know that systems like this can exist. And now we can figure out using computers just what the fate of this system will be. This is actually a busy day for solar systems undergoing formation. The Atacama Large Millimeter Array has actually been busy doing a massive survey called the Disk Substructures at High Angular Resolutions Project, or D-Sharp. As part of this project, they've been imaging the disks around 20 of the nearest solar systems in the process of forming. These are young stars, in a few cases as young as only a million years old. By examining the debris disk of gas and dust around each of these young stars, we can start to get snapshots of what solar system formation looks like at a whole variety of different stages. What the scientists working on this project are finding is that it's the larger planets, the Neptunes, that appear to be forming first. Jupiter's as well, Saturn's too. The rocky worlds, they appear to form much later, forming in those places that currently appear to be, well, brightly colored swaths between dark gaps in the disk. Those gaps each represent a world that's already formed. And in the space between the gaps, we'll get terrestrial planets someday in the future. So in this case, mind the gap, because that's where the big worlds happen to be, and watch the spaces in between, because that's where the terrestrial planets are going to form. Now, that was a whole lot of really fast-paced news. There wasn't a whole lot in-depth conceptually or theoretically to try and explain today. It's kind of a pretty pictures kind of day. And that's OK. It's a Friday. And I don't know about you, but my brain is kind of full. But I'm happy to give you any more information you want. 
because I'm now going to take your questions. Now, before I do that, I'm going to remind you, please go ahead and at me in the chat so I can spot your questions more easily. And as always, I want to remind you that this show is a production of the Planetary Science Institute working in collaboration with Youngstown State University. We are here because of you. We are supported through your subscriptions and every bit really matters. And uh, if you do happen to miss an episode, that's okay. You can always check us out over on YouTube and catch every episode just a few hours after the live recording. Now, if you are watching this over on YouTube, please give us a subscription. And uh, if you want to catch it live and ask some questions, we go out live most Mondays through Fridays at 1 p.m. Eastern. So I'm now going to take a look at your questions and thank Tom Van Scooter for resubscribing. That's five months in a row. Thank you so much for being here and being one of our supporters, Tom. Now flipping through your questions to see what you had to say. Um, Magnus Thimer, I, I don't know if I said your username correctly. Magnus asks, why was it a goal for Insight to land in the most boring part of the Martian surface? Well, in this case, it's because we're actually interested in what's going on beneath the surface by finding some place nice and smooth to land, nice and boring to land. They assured themselves the capability of reaching out with their seismograph, deploying it flat against the surface relatively easily, not having to try and pick their way out among the rocks. With that seismograph snug up against the soil, they're going to be able to measure uh, waves moving through the planet. Mars, like all the other solid worlds in our solar system, has the potential to quake, either when it gets hit with a incoming rock from space, when there is a landslide on the surface, um, and there may even be naturally occurring Mars quakes due to geological processes interior to the planet. We just don't know. But we can find out by listening. In this case, the seismograph is capable of detecting vibrations that are just the size of an atom across. By looking for uh, vibrations that tiny, they're able to measure not just the primary earthquake wave that comes in, but it turns out planetary waves, they'll radiate away from an earthquake and actually go around the world more than once by detecting how long it takes for those echoes to come back to the detector. They're able to hone in on exactly where the origins on the world, the Mars quake started. So that's part of the science. We want to understand the quakes that occur so that we can map out the interior of the world. The other thing is we're going to deploy a thermal device that's going to bury itself meters under the ground. And again, we want to be able to reach out with our detector, find a nice smooth place to hammer it into the ground using a robotic arm. If we landed someplace rocky, if we landed someplace complex, it might be harder to find a safe place to deploy these instruments. By landing someplace good and boring, well, it's easier for us to deploy the instruments. Um, so looking to see what other kinds of questions we have out there. Hanny is asking, could these types of solar systems have occurred more often back when population three stars were forming? Um, are, are you asking about the solar systems that have um, two stars of massively different masses, that is actually potentially possible. The, the reason I phrase it that way is early on in our universe, we didn't have as many heavy elements. It took time for carbon, oxygen, nitrogen, and everything heavier on the periodic table to form inside of stars and through the explosions of stars and the collision of stars. It's only out of stellar death that we get these heavy elements. 
The first few generations of stars were pretty much made of the material that resulted from the Big Bang that formed the universe. They were mostly hydrogen and helium, little bits of lithium and beryllium. And we know that the very first stars to form were probably gigantic and nothing like the stars we see today. And out of their remnants, other stars quickly formed. And it could be that in those systems, we did find this happening more often because we didn't have the heavy elements to form planets and we didn't have the heavy elements that would allow the newly forming stars to radiate energy in the same ways. Now, I don't know for certain, this is just something that makes sense. And I hope that more people think about this question and we find research papers on it in the future. Um, so Magnus, um, sorry, I already got that question. Let's see what other questions are down here. Um, so someone with a dark name, the stealth DJ is asking, are all those protoplanet systems you just showed in the same place nebula? No, they're actually scattered about on the sky. Um, they're simply the nearest ones that we're able to get a good clean view of. Um, so Hanny then went on to ask, do the planetary systems we are seeing usually have Jupiters and Neptunes in the normal locations? Well, we don't actually know what normal locations are. Do they have them in the places that we have them? Um, sometimes, but when we look at these disks, we're looking at things that are actually far bigger than our solar system. Over time, solar systems rearrange themselves. The planets migrate inwards, they get flung back outwards. And where the planets start during this proto protoplanetary disk phase has no bearing on where they're going to completely end up unless they migrate all the way into the center. So yes, we do see gas giants, ice giants in the outer solar systems, but we also see them in the inner solar systems and we don't know what's the normal place. This is still a new area of science and a whole lot more needs to be observed. 20 is currently our biggest, our biggest example of these things. Thank you so much, Cherry Blossom, for hosting over. Um, we love raids. Thank you so much. Um, so yeah, let me pull that image back up. So when we look at these systems, and there's actually some more here that I cut off. Um, when we look at all these dis different systems, they all look radically different. They're astronomical units across, um, in some cases, significantly larger than our solar system, in some cases, smaller. Um, but these are the only systematically observed sample we have. And 20 isn't enough to say what is normal, what is usual, what do we expect to see? So here's to many more of these things being observed. Um, oh, Sladas has a question above. Let me scroll up and see if I can find it. So Sladaz is asking, um, is saying, I'm a 19 year old geodesy student from Russia. Oh, Privyat, Kaktela. Um, just ask at my uni if I can try to do something useful and interesting by my own in astronomy field and get your website suggested. Oh, that's awesome. Um, so I think it's better to ask here how difficult, interesting, useful, helpful it might be to try what you are doing. Um, we would welcome you helping us out. We have a lot of different data projects going on over at CosmoQuest.org. You can drop us an email at CosmoQuestX at gmail.com and we can help you find something that will produce useful science and is also really helpful for what we're doing. Um, and we have some Russian speakers. I um, we, we have people on our team who speak Russian really well. I'm not one of them. I just speak it si kind of. So drop us an email and we'll help figure out how to get you involved. Um, <laughs> so Hanny is asking, is the core, if the core of Mars is cold, what could be causing any Mars quakes? Um, 
So I can't speak French, Hanny. That was your next question. Is there anything I can't do? I cannot speak French. I cannot pronounce French things. When it comes to the French language, I am hopeless. Um, so uh, s quakes just means the world is shaking. Our planet experiences shakes from fracking, from nuclear underground testing, from landslides, from tsunamis. Thank you so much, Ed Thompson, for the bits. Thank you. Um, all of these different shaking experiences that the red planet has, they can come from landslides. We've seen landslides happening on Mars. They can occur when Mars gets hit by an incoming asteroid. We've seen fresh craters form on Mars. We know that it regularly gets hit by rocks from space. All these things can externally shake Mars, causing waves to ripple through the world that will allow us to map out its interior. So it's kind of cool. It's kind of cool. Um, <laughs> so, so Larry, that's across all of Twitch. So those of you who are seeing the message about direct relief, Twitch is currently doing a fundraiser all across Twitch where anyone who donates using the charity hashtag, their bits will be matched by Twitch with the funding going directly to direct relief. You can find out more by clicking on the link that is being shown in the chat. We're doing a completely separate fundraiser here at CosmoQuest. You can see the information down there. Um, we're in the process of trying to raise $60,000 by Christmas. Um, we had we had issues come up with our NASA funding. We'd been warned back in late summer that James Webb Space Telescope cost overruns and changes in how NASA funds citizen science might lead to some funding cuts. And um, they led to pretty much all of our funding being cut. We're still funded to work with the OSIRIS-REx mission. Um, but this means that we need to find new funding and it's going to take us time to do that and i'm hoping that all of you out there will give us some christmas joy and make it so that i don't have to fire my entire staff for christmas um we can rescue people at least long enough to find new jobs and hopefully long enough for me to find new grants um if everyone just pitches in a little so that's that's what this fundraiser that you see linked down here is and we're going to do 40 hours of science for science on december 22nd and 23rd it's going to be a 40 hour straight twitch stream with multiple hosts so we don't break the terms of service and you're all invited to show up but you don't have to wait to donate um so I'm hoping you'll spread the word. You'll ask others to contribute if they can, because together we can do a whole lot more science than we can do apart. And science really can't get done without funding. So if you've ever groused that NASA doesn't get a big enough budget, this is your chance to step in where NASA couldn't anymore and help us do more science over at CosmoQuest.org. Okay, that's the sad bit of the day. Let's move on to better things. Um, yeah. Okay, so um, more questions. We want more questions. I don't see more questions. Um, so other things that are going on. Um, today, there will not be a live recording of Astronomy Cast. Uh, my co-host Fraser Kane is on a much deserved vacation. He's out in Hawaii with his wife. Um, and we wish him the best in a world full of volcanoes and sulfa, which I am terribly allergic to. So more for him, less for me. Um, I will be coming on later today when my voice is a bit repaired from where it is right now to record live a bunch of sponsorship messages for 365 days of astronomy. If you would like to sponsor that podcast, this is your chance to make me say anything rated G you would like me to say. Um, buy yourself a sponsorship day, input a message on the form that we'll send you, 
and uh, I will read your sponsorship text out loud. So wish someone a happy birthday, congratulate them on an anniversary, or just ask me to say a tongue twister in honor of your donation. This is Anything Goes, $45 to sponsor one day of 365 days of astronomy. So yeah, I'll be back later today to do that. Um, so looking at the questions, Fenrik is asking, would we expect protoplanetary disks to continue contracting? Thank you so much, Bill Nash. That's amazing. And can we get out, get a shout out for Bill Nash? He's another one of the science and education streamers here on Twitch. Uh, he's a photographer. He does amazing work. You can learn Lightroom while watching his stream. And he's working on learning astrophotography. So... There's a lot of really amazing stuff out there. You can learn from him. Um, I know I find Lightroom kind of a black box, so I lurk on his stream trying to understand, well, how to use it a little bit better. Um, Pamela picked a peck if pickled peppers. I don't think that says what you meant it to say, Hanny. Um, but yes, all... The rockets. Let's totally light up that chat. Let's launch all the rockets. And everyone, go give Bill a follow. He does really good work around here. And it's beautiful. Um, it's always nice when learning and beauty can come together all at the same time. Um, yeah. Um, okay somewhere above all those rockets which are glorious and awesome um hanny asked what is mars 2020 going to do that is different from all the other rovers oh man i don't remember the details right now i know it has different biological experiments on it it's going to be looking for complex organic molecules this is why they're sending it to part of mars where the surface is regularly getting eroded away. We can't easily dig. Digging takes a whole lot of energy. So if we want to see things that haven't been exposed to the sunlight to sunlight for a long time, because ultraviolet rays from the sun really break down organic compounds, we have to either dig or go somewhere where the soil is kind of fresh and new. It's going to an area that's rich in sand dunes, rich in erosion. And by going somewhere where the surface is young, hopefully we'll see freshly revealed organic materials from the past. It's also going to be gathering up rocks in hope that someday we'll send back a second spacecraft that it will be able to rove those rocks up to and hand them over so that we can bring back samples of rocks from Mars that we know exactly where they were gathered. We have Mars rocks. They've kind of fallen on us from space, but we don't know where on Mars they came from. Being able to understand where the rocks came from helps us get what we call ground truth. It helps us match up what we see from space with what is actually on the surface. So Mars 2020 is going to be gathering those rocks and uh, sampling those soils and helping us figure out just where life might once have been and maybe just maybe could still be located on the red planet. Um, yeah, robogeologists are awesome. Oh, back up to Fenring's question. Um, sorry, 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 backing up. Go follow Bill Nash. Go follow Bill Nash. Um, Fenring, would we expect protoplanetary disks to continue contracting if the star didn't form in the middle? Or would they hit certain size and stay there? So the nature of protoplanetary disks is you only get them when there's a star in the center. You need enough mass to collapse down that, okay, backing up a few steps. I have a fabulous thing I can use on my desk. Okay, I have a fluffy thing. We're gonna pretend this fluffy thing is a cloud of dust and gas because I think that's a really good thing for this fluffy thing to be. This fluffy thing, when it gets shocked, will begin contracting until you're left with a small thing down in the center. That small thing left in the center is 
all of that gas and dust that might have been light years across, but super non-dense, the opposite of dense, super diffuse. You take all of that super diffuse stuff, you let it gravitationally contract, gravitationally contract, gravitationally contract, so that it goes from this to this. And you end up with a star's worth of stuff that will form a star, depending on how much of a star's worth, a star of a different size. But it's not a clean process. The star never manages to gather up all the stuff around it. And this is because it lights up and starts pushing outwards with light before the disc fully contracts. So the disc is trying to contract, trying to contract, and the star is like, nope, I'm going to push back with light. And it's that pushback with light that prevents all the material from streaming in and leaves material out there to form the planets. If you don't have a star in the center, it's just going to keep contracting and you're going to end up with a tight knot of dust and gas. It's not very interesting. It's kind of boring and it doesn't have planets. So to get planets, you have to have that star. As far as we know, we, we don't fully understand planetary system fo formation. We just kind of had broad brush strokes. We're still working to fill in the details, but this is our current understanding. I, I hope that answered your question. So Hanny is asking how do moons work since planets don't give light? So moons are one of these things that is deeply confusing. Um, our moon is easy. Our moon formed out of a great splash. Our world got hit by something, that something caused our world to fragment, that other world to merge and fragment. The fragments went splush, they coalesced, formed a moon, we had our Earth. Um, we see evidence that Triton orbiting around Neptune is probably a captured Kuiper Belt object. We see other moons around Jupiter that... Um, appear to be captured around Saturn that appear to be captured but there are moons that appear to have formed in situ around Jupiter and Saturn and possibly Neptune and Uranus and recent observations combined with computer models seem to indicate that you can get eddies within the planetary disks within these structures like Alma is showing us and eddies around the planets that are in the process of forming. Those eddies, those swirly bits in the forming planets, those look like they just might be capable of creating moons. Um, we discussed this a couple weeks ago here on Daily Space. Um, you may be able to go back and find it. So Stormer Joe is asking, can you please repeat the description of the comet you discussed? Um, so the comet we dis discussed is Comet uh, 46P uh, Wertunin. It is a comet that comes around the sun every 5.4 years. Right now, it is about as close to the sun as it's going to get and about as close to the Earth as it's going to get at the same time. This means that the sunlight has got it, it as excited and coma -y and expanded out as a comet can get. And because it's nearby, it's easier to see. So this is pretty much the best view we're going to get of this particular world. So you can go out tonight and see it located between the Pleiades and the star Aldebaran as a faint green smudge that's kind of hard to see. Um, so Uncle Bill is asking, so a brown dwarf or a rogue Jupiter might form from the whole cloud and not form any satellites. I don't know how brown dwarfs factor in. Don't know. Um, and I don't know if a Jupiter has enough mass to gravitationally collapse a cloud against thermodynamics well enough. So, so what you're dealing with is, is your cloud of stuff, it's gas. It's gas at a given temperature, which means that the individual motions are pushing outwards. They have a pressure. And as you try 
and collapse down the cloud, the pressure increases. Pressure increases, temperature increases, and this pressure outwards is fighting against gravity. And I don't know if a system that has a Jupiter's worth of mass is capable of collapsing all the way down to form a Jupiter. Thank you, Gordon, so much. And I need to find that graphic and change it. Thank you so much for triggering a zombie, Gordon. You are fabulous. Yay, zombies. I will put science in your brain to replace whatever the zombies are eating. Um, thank you, Uncle Bill, for hosting over. Um, okay, so I was answering something. I totally forgot what I was at answering. Mm, Jupiter collapsing. I don't know if a Jupiter mass has enough mass that the gravity will overcome the gas pressure to allow it to form. Um, maybe if it was in a cold enough area of space, I just don't know. Don't know. But now you know the factors that go into me not knowing. Um, Okay, Origami is asking, sorry if I shouldn't ask this here, but is there going to be an episode of Astronomy Cast today? No, I'm, Fraser is on a much deserved vacation out in Hawaii with his wife. Um, so we're gonna let them vacation. Um, I will be back on later to record um, sponsorship messages for 365 days of astronomy. So if you want to go purchase one and tell me what you want me to say, I'll record what you want me to say as long as it's rated G. So this is your chance to make me say tongue twisters. Um, or just wish someone you love a happy birthday or celebrate your local astronomy club or anything like that. Um, yes, brains are for thinking, not for feeding zombies. I plan to feed brains science. It's what I do. Um, okay, other science questions. Um, Mimas is indeed the death star. Iapetus, I don't know if Iapetus has a stargate. Um, Iapetus, I believe, is the one that's two radically different colors. <coughs> Sorry. <clears throat> I'm still re Wow, I've totally lost my voice. <coughs> I'm still recovering from bronchitis. Um... So let me grab a picture and try and drop it in to the slideshow for you. Um, so this is Iopetus. It is a two-tone kind of world that has a ring around it. We now actually think we understand how these form. You take two objects, you collide them together, and if you do it at just the right velocity, they end up with this weird ravioli belt around the center. Um, and Mimas does look like a Death Star. Hold on and I'll get you a picture of Mimas. Um, it is kind of like a walnut. There's others like Pan that look very ravioli shaped. Um, I am a fan of Pan's ravioli shape. Sorry, it didn't want to copy in. What is amazing to me is Mimas, which looks like a Death Star, didn't completely fall apart when the crater on its surface got formed. Oh, I'm having all the technological drag fails. Here we go. These are not to scale. These are just the sizes of the pictures I dropped in. So this is actually a moon, Ed Thompson. This is actually a moon. Um, oh, Arthur C. Clarke put his Stargate there. Um, I've been re-watching the original Stargate SG-1 series, and I'm like, I don't think the Guild ever went there. Um, okay, I need to go back and read Stargate more. Um, it's true, Pan refused to grow up and be a sphere. It is entirely true. 
Okay, if there are no more science questions, if there are no more science questions, I am going to leave you with a reminder to go outside and look up. Now is your chance to go see the comet 46P where Tunin it's not going to be back for 5.4 more years and the alignment we're having now we're not going to have for a few more decades. So go catch yourselves a bright green star in the sky. It's out there between the Perseids and Aldebaran and uh, wherever you are in the world. Have a fabulous morning, evening, or afternoon. Bye-bye.